we'll turn it over to you in a little bit. So we have the recording going, and um, welcome everybody to our Polar Connect event. We're um, going to be talking with uh, Lisa Seth, who is up in Barrow, Alaska, this morning, and um, it seems to be a cool morning all across Alaska. I think uh, winter might be on its way. Um, we're going to be learning about what she's been working on um, and the science behind. Um, the Bowhead Well work that they're doing. Today is Friday, September 7, 2012. And again, I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Um, if you're having trouble hearing me um, or any of us or having any technical issues, you're welcome to uh, use the chat room to let Sarah and myself know that something's going on. And we'll try to work through it as we facilitate this webinar. Um, you should be seeing another slide, a slide that shows um, the Features Blackboard Collaborate. The slide should have changed, and the, um, you will not be seeing any video other than Lisa's head today. <laughs> but we won't have any real-time video other than that. So everything else should be showing up on the screen. There's a list of participants. Um, you should be listed there. And if you have a question as we go along, you click on the little hand icon that's above the list of participants. And that's like raising your hand and lets us know you have a question. You can use the chat room to ask questions. And as some of you have already started, you're introducing yourselves and telling us who's in your class and where you're all from so that we know who, who's joining us today. This event will be archived, and we'll send out a link and put it on um, the website later on. Um, another slide just appeared. It says participant introductions. Again, just let us know who you are, where you're at, and how many students or adults are with you um, to give us a good idea of what's going on. The next thing we wanted to share with you before we turn it over to Lisa is what is Polar Trek? So why would someone like um, Lisa Seth be all the way up in Barrow, Alaska looking at bowhead wells? Well, she's part of a National Science Foundation funded project run by ARCUS here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And it's an opportunity for teachers such as Lisa to go um, with scientists and get hands-on experiences. And we call this program Polar Trek. So we take teachers from all across the United States. They join scientists both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And they share what they're learning um, to all of us. And, um, and then they take it back to their classrooms. So that's why Lisa's up in Barrow, Alaska. Um, we'll get to this in a little while, but if you have questions, as, we, as Lisa is presenting or at any time, questions can be, um, again, if it's during the presentation, we want you to type your question in the chat box. Um, if you're having technical issues, you can also do that. And at the end of the presentation, you want to, again, click on the little hand button if you want to ask your question live. And then um, we will call on you, and we'll have you click on the mic once to open up the mic and click on it once to close. But we'll go back over those um, instructions when it comes time to, um, to do the presentation. And um, I just wanted to relay to Lisa that um, our mail server was down this morning. And we just got the message about your, um, your slides and the PDFs and stuff like that. So um, sorry. Lisa, I'm going to send it to your email address, but it's coming from my personal Gmail account. If you still need the PDF, it's coming. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Lisa, since I know she's waiting, coffee in hand. And uh, Lisa, it's your turn. We are not hearing you, Lisa. You need to click on the mic. Lisa, we are not hearing you. So you may be having bandwidth issues in uh, Barrow and connection issues. Um, it does have the phone call things. So you may need to call in, Lisa, if you ha if it keeps on going like this. We're giving you the number to call in. 
so that we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, nothing's showing up, Lisa. We can't hear you at all. So we're working through this. Uh, sorry if you're just joining us. Um, Lisa is having some technical difficulties of her own, and she has to um, not use the voice over IP through the internet because it's not working right now. We can see her moving around, so we got video anyway. But she doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> so she's gone away, I think. She's on her way to find a phone. <laughs> And this goes for any of you. If you have any trouble with uh, the sound or anything, there is a backup option. You can always dial the 1-800 number and join us that way. So at least you'll hear it, and then uh, we can send a PDF if you need to. Well, I guess we can't right now because our server's down too. Um, yeah, I sent it just um, by Gmail, so that should work. Yeah, so Anne Marie, um, we can only see Lisa Small right now. If she had her talk button available, she'd be able to sort of jump into the big screen, but she seems to have trouble with a moment. So we're going to let her get settled, but yes, we can squint and see her down below. Uh, okay, so. I have a phone right here, Janet, if you want me to call. Yes, you will need to do that. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to step away from the computer for a moment. Okay. So we just have some people just joining us here. And um, we were starting a presentation. Um, and we ended up having some technical difficulties with Lisa. She, you can see her little head there. But because she can't get on the microphone um, through her computer, that's not working for some reason. Um, she's going to have to dial in by phone. And uh, I'll just respond to that. Lisa, you could go out and come back in if you want to give that a try as well. Um, in the meantime, while she's getting squared away, we have a slide up of the crew that is part of the, um, the scientific project that is happening um, in Barrow, looking at bowhead whales. Um, and um, we have uh, uh, a number of these scientists have been to Alaska many times and have worked out there. And Lisa has been having a good time working with them. So hopefully you've been following along on her journals. Um, although this morning she said they've been, um, they have been stuck at, in barrel for a couple of days because though of the weather and the ice conditions. And they haven't been able to go out. So we hope we'll get to hear that about their experience here in a little bit. Yes, so there's some talk about what Lisa's holding. It is a jellyfish, and um, I don't know what species of jellyfish, but maybe we'll get to learn that here at some point too from the team. Okay, I see that Lisa has come back on again, and we'll see if she has better connection now that she has uh, gone away and come back. This is the thing. Some communities around the world still don't have quite the technology um, and bandwidth to do all these things. So that's why we have a backup with the phone. And oh, oh, here we go. Yep, we got it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, I'll get started. Good morning. Let's try that again. Yeah, you can hang up. All right, good morning, everyone. So we'll get we'll get started. And Sarah and Janet are going to work the slides for us. And welcome to Barrow, Alaska. I'm here with I'm going to tilt the computer a little bit. <laughs> we have Dr. Ashin over on one side. She's trying to wave, but there's a little bit of lag time, so that's her hand. <laughs> and Dr. Bob Campbell. And then I'm afraid to move the computer too much. So over to my other side is Dr. Steve Oaken from the University of Alaska. Um, and we're here today to tell you a little bit about the research that they've been working on for actually eight years um, up in Barrow on the oceanographic conditions of the bowhead whale habitat. 
And we also have Phil, and his last name is actually Elot Elotalo, um, without the P on the end. Um, and he's not here with us today, but he was here the first couple of days and, and really helped me quite a bit. So we wanted to make sure that we included him on, on that slide. Um, so that's, that's the team that's up here. And then we also, you'll be introduced in a few minutes with some other slides. So we're lucky to have uh, two gentlemen, both with their captain's license, running the uh, research vessel OPIC. So, um, so here we are. And let's, let's show you and have you join our expedition and go to the next slide. So you'll see the, the Polar Trek journey a little bit for me was I first heard about Polar Trek back a year ago in September and decided to apply. And I think most of many of the eighth graders that were with me at the time were part of that journey. And in November found that we'd made the first cut. And then December had a phone call with Dr. Ashen and, and some other uh, Polar Trek archivists and uh, people about the expedition. And then in early January, I was notified that I would be going to Barrow, Alaska to join the research team. And I was very excited. And the next question I thought was, where is Barrow, Alaska? <laughs> so you'll notice on the map that it's quite a distance from Springs in East Hampton, New York. And uh, it's really at the northernmost point of the United States, up, up by Point Barrow. And um, so then I knew where it was. So the next, next event was to start learning a little bit about the research that they would be doing and start preparing for our journey. So the next slide. So to help get all of the teachers that were selected for the Polar Trek experience, about half of the teachers were selected by Antarctic research expedition teams, and the other half chosen by Arctic research expeditions. And we all met in Fairbanks, Alaska. The day I arrived in Fairbanks, I was introduced to what real cold is. It was negative 39 degrees the morning that I got there. And I think most of the spring students will remember that we had a very exciting moment upon arrival it was the Yukon Quest dog sled race. So those are some pictures of some of the dogs in the upper right-hand corner. And that was really fun to follow that race. And some of the spring students had some great questions when I was Skyping live with them, which some of you may remember. I was sitting in a snowbank from Fairbanks. It was about 4 in the morning then. Right now, it's about 7.30 in the morning here in Barrow. And uh, the questions were, what are some of the differences between Springs, East Hampton, and Alaska. And one of the big differences I found was the night sky and getting to see the aurora borealis and then coming back and, and learning about what actually causes that was, was very exciting. And comparing the angle of the sun, especially with the solar panels from the, the roof of our school to the solar panels at the Cold uh, Research Center lab uh, just outside of Fairbanks. So the orientation was awesome. And it was a lot of science and a lot of technology. Um, professional development, which was, was really quite amazing and prepared us really well to move forward with our expedition. And next slide. So then as a bonus, bonus, there was a professional development workshop that was up here in Barrow in May and came up with a group of North Slope teachers, which are the teachers from the district of the school systems that are up here and also met Dr. Okinen for the first time, uh, which was terrific to be able to see Barrow and, and to meet uh, my third researcher. I, I met Dr. Ashen and Dr. Campbell actually in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, early in April. Um, so it was really great to be able to meet everyone before coming back up here in August. And it was also wonderful to be able to see the ice, the sea ice, because Barrow was pretty much solidly frozen in with sea ice. And I learned a little bit about keeping an eye out for polar bears. And just the other day, we were told there was a really large skinny one walking around the campus of Narl where we're actually staying. So we're always keeping an eye out, but we, we haven't seen one. And you just, uh, you just watch what you're doing. And then down in the lower right-hand corner is Matt Conforti. And for all those Springs kids that sent out the postcards, that's him actually in the Barrow Post Office in early August. And he's passing the postcards to the postmaster. And he's the one who helped ship them to get them back to you.
Great. Next slide. Lisa, do you mind talking just a little slower? And Lisa, do you mind talking just a little slower? Oh, sure. Next slide, sir. Great. So after the February in Fairbanks and May in Barrow, I was able to start bringing back uh, some of the science that we would be working on. And so you might recognize some of the eighth graders there working on a sea ice versus land-based ice lab in class in the lower right-hand side. That's and then you can see some kids trying on the extreme weather gear, which it hasn't actually been that cold up here. It's been in the 30s and 40s, um, although with the wind blowing and the snow coming down, it feels a little bit colder. But it was fun to try on the extreme weather gear and the bunny boots and, and things. And then we started learning about what do bowhead whales eat. And a large part of their diet is krill. And if you remember, during the Skype session at Springs, um, we went over what zoo plankton are. And the zoo makes you think of animals. And the plankton are wanderers. So zoo plankton are small animals that wander through the ocean with the ocean currents. And then on the far right were some cards that some of the younger elementary grades wrote, like Ms. Diaz's class, um, when I returned from the trip to Fairbanks is when I got those back. So it was great to be able to start bringing the science back even before the expedition. And now I've been here, and I've learned quite a bit more to bring back to the school. So I'm really looking forward to that. Okay. Hey, we're going to shift over to Dr. Ashton, who's going to talk a little bit. And so let me slide over a bit. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You can just go. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about bowhead whales. So the map shows us where bowhead whales are found during the year. This is a year in the life of a bowhead whale. You see the pink down in the bottom left. That's where they spend the winter down in the northern Bering Sea. Then during the spring, they swim up along the coast of Alaska all the way over to uh, Arctic Canada which is on the, on the right-hand side of the graph of the picture. And they spend the spring and summer up in Arctic Canada. That's where they, they vacation in Canada. And then in the fall, they swim back along the coast of northern Alaska. And they go over to the, to the Russian side and then migrate again back down to the Bering Sea uh, to spend the winter. So they are doing this migration every year in a predictable way. So as they go up the coast of Alaska, they um, pass by all the Alaska coastal villages where the Inupiat or Eskimos live. And the people who live here have been relying on the whales coming to be able to get food. And they've been doing this for centuries. So whaling is an important part of their culture. Next slide, please. So we've been working in Barrow since 2005, and our, our science was based on this observation that whales are always seen near Barrow in the spring and the fall, and why are the whales seen here? So our first question was, why are the whales stopping at Barrow during their migration? And our, our hypothesis, or what we asked, could this be the reason why this is happening? is that we think they were staying here in the, stopping here in the fall because they find a lot of food. Some of their, their prey is found here in, in high concentrations, in dense patches um, at Barrow. So we were wondering, if this is true, what in the oceanography makes these patches form? And then, how is this going to change between different years? Some years we have a cold year, some years we have a warm year. How, how is this going to change and how it might this change the amount of food that the whales find and then when and how long the whales will stay in Barrow and be available for the people who live here? And finally, our last question was, how could climate variability change these patterns in bowhead whale migration? Or will they change them? They might not it might not change them. Next slide, please. 
So let's talk a little bit about what the whales eat. The top picture shows a bowhead whale. This was taken, this photograph was taken from an airplane. And you can see the, the white line there uh, showing the scale or the size of a whale. The bowhead whales, so when they're an adult, they're about 40 to 60 feet long. This is from their nose to the middle of their tail. They eat plankton. They like to eat copepods and krill. And there are pictures on the bottom that are showing this prey for the whales. The left side shows a krill, which is, its real name is a but we call them krill generally. And look at the scale bar. A krill is only 0.6 to 0.8 of an inch long. That's a pretty small food particle for an animal that's 40 to 60 feet long. The right hand side you see a copepod. It's even smaller. So the bowhead whales need, are feeding on these plankton. And they feed using baleen, which is in their mouths. And it's sort of like a comb where they filter water through. And the plankton gets stuck on the hairs of their baleen. And then the whales lick the plankton off of the hairs and, and eat them. Another thing is you might notice is with whales being this big and their prey being that small, they need to find an awful lot of prey in order to even, to even not be hungry every day. So that's why it's so important that we find these patches of prey at Barrow, because here the whales can find enough to eat. Next, please. So how are we doing this? Well, for the past eight years, since 2005, we've been sampling the oceanography here in Barrow. We've used two different boats. You see them on the left. The first one is the Annika Marie. We used her every year until now. And she's 43 feet long. And the one on the bottom is the Ukpik, which is the boat we're using this year. She's 50 feet long. And she's similar to the Annika Marie, but, um, but just a little bit bigger. And so we sample um, off the coast of Barrow. And on the right, you see a map of all the locations we've sampled. Um, from 2005 until 2011. So each dot shows a place where we stopped and sampled um, from the boat. And the lines show, show transect lines across which we have sampled. So you can see that we're sampling from the coast way out into the ocean. The line, um, one of those lines is, say, 46 to 50 kilometers long, or no, is it miles, Steve? Miles. It's miles, excuse me. Nautical miles, which is even a little bit longer than a mile on land. So we go quite far out into the ocean. Next slide, please. And at each of these locations, we're sampling the ocean. We use an instrument called a CTD to measure the temperature of the water and the salinity, and also the depth at which we're sampling everything. We also sample using this instrument to, uh, for fluorescence, which tells us how much plant pigment there is in the water. We sample using a Niskin bottle, which is this funny bottle that you see in the bottom. Um, that you send down into the water, and it closes and close it at a certain depth, so you catch water at, at, say, 10 meters depth. And we collect water from those to measure the amount of nutrients, which is like a fertilizer and um, also the amount of very, very small zooplankton, animals that are smaller than, than the, um, the copepods and the krill on which the whales feed. We use an instrument that we tow next to the boat called an acoustic Doppler current profiler to understand what the currents look like, the velocity, which way the water is moving, and how fast, and also how many particles or plankton there might be in the water. And then we use a couple of different kinds of nets. There's pictures of both of them on the left. The tucker trawl, which is the big one in the middle, is a, a net that we lower down through the water all the way to the seafloor. And we sort of tow along the seafloor briefly using with the net resting on those sleds that you see in the bottom. And then a ring net, which is shown in the bottom left. And those two nets we use to collect the, the whale prey to find out how much prey is present at each location that we're sampling. Next slide, please. And I'm going to end with just an example of how the ocean and the environment can vary between years. So this is satellite images. Um, this is from taken from a satellite. It's, it's visual. And it shows Barrow. You can see the, the brown is the, uh, is, is the land mass. And Barrow is at the tip of that land mass. And it shows um, 
an image for each of the years in which we've sampled so far um, with for, for, in about August. We tried to pick it about the same time in August, but you can see that in the later years we've been having a little bit of trouble because it's often very cloudy up here and you can't see through the clouds. What you're seeing on these images is clouds, which is in the white, but then if you look at 2006, you see all those little white dots on the ocean. That's sea ice. So what these images are showing us is how much sea ice was seen in each year in which we've been sampling. And I want to point especially to 2006 where we see a lot of sea ice. There are no clouds in that picture. That's all sea ice. I think. And then if you go to 2007 and 2008, you see no sea ice. So we have had a lot of variability from year to year in the amount of sea ice that we see um, in Vero. And this has an impact or an effect on the water, water temperature. The whole region is warmer in the years without sea ice and we have warmer ocean temperatures. And I want to point out the graph in the bottom right. This shows um, the, average, the sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean for May through September. And it's the, the top graph thing where I'm pointing to is the average sea ice extent. This is an average for from 1979 to or 2000 or 2010. There, there's two averages on there. And then there's two lines that fall below the average. The first is 2007. That's the dotted line. And 2007 was the year that had the least sea ice extent before this year. Then you see 2012. I've circled it in red. That's what's going on this year. We've already seen less sea ice in the Arctic Ocean this year than we had seen before in, in, our, in our, our records, our satellite records. So this is an interesting year. There's, there's very little sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. There was a lot of ice around Barrow in early August, but it's all gone now. We don't have any sea ice. And we've got pretty warm temperatures out in the ocean. And that's the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, I can um, ask. You can ask me yeah, later. Thanks. Great. Thank you, you so much, Dr. Ashton. Yeah. We have a yes. lot of questions. Yes. We do have a lot of questions. Let's start with just three or 15 questions. But let's start with just three or maybe. Does temperature affect migration? We'll press the talk button one more time to talk. Lisa, if you could help, that would be great. There you go. Okay. So temperature, ocean temperature could affect migration. And there's a bunch of scientists, not just us, working on this question right now. We're, we're looking at historical records and also information collected over the last, say, 15 or 20 years on whales and whale migrations and the timings of, of whale migrations. So one thought is that in a warm year, they might stay in Canada a little bit longer because, you know, their, their vacation is pretty pleasant over there. And we don't really know what cues them to decide when to migrate, but, um, but it does seem that in 2007 when we had no ice, the whales did come very late that year. But this is something we're all still trying to put together to answer, but it could, it could affect migration. And where are they now? And where are they now? Most of the whales are in Canada still, but they're starting to migrate back along the coast. There have been whales seen in the Barrow area, but we did not see any yet because the weather's been pretty awful, and so it's harder to see whales when there's a lot of waves. But we, people from airplanes have seen whales, and um, people from boats have seen whales. The Probably most of them are still over in Canada, but they're definitely starting their migration now. Great. I'm going to bring one more question here because it's about ocean conditions. And they want to know what the warmest water temperature ever was recorded in Barrow. Click the top button, Lisa. Sorry, we think it keeps turning off on its own. Turned up again, didn't it? 
Okay. So um, the, the warmest temperatures we've seen in Barrow were 11 to 12 degrees, and that was in 2007. That's centigrade. Uh, all right, thanks. All right, let's move on and take time for the moment. Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay, so getting some great questions there. Um, a lot to keep up with. <laughs> just to stay on this slide for one one second, just it's when Dr. Ashin mentioned the, there being ice or, or no ice, if you think about if it's a hot summer's day and you're going to go play sports, what color shirt you might want to wear? Which shirt would you wear to stay cooler? And if you think about that, everyone yell out the answer. If you all yell at once, maybe we can actually hear it in Barrow. One, two, three, what color shirt? Oh, right. I heard you wear a white shirt to stay cooler. <laughs> so when you think about it, the more ice that there is on the ocean up here, the more light that gets reflected instead of absorbed. And especially with these photographs, you, you really get an idea of, of how dark the ocean is compared to the ocean when it has ice on it. Um, so we'll just, and we'll go more into that when I get back home. Next slide. Okay. So now we begin the adventure of when I left Springs, East Hampton, and traveled out to actually to Prudhoe Bay first, uh, which was really exciting to meet the boat and to meet our co-captains on board. Uh, the owner of the research vessel, vessel Ukpik, is Captain Bill Coplin, and then the co-captain is Mike Fleming. And I know that a lot of people and a lot of my students were a little concerned about uh, my being safe and taken care of when I got up to this area. And I really couldn't have asked for a better boat or better captains um, to have taken care of all of us while we're doing the research. And Prudhoe Bay was really a wild place. It uh, was out on a very flat area, so it's out in the tundra. And all you see really looking in distant uh, distances are these just giant, oh, what's the, what's the Mel Gibson movie with the, uh, oh, yeah. uh, trying to think of the movie to explain it, but there's just a lot of piping all over the place and a lot of industrial buildings. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of the Mad Max building, sort of a, a futuristic scene, and it just was, was really wild, but amidst all of the industry, we actually saw uh, a small herd of uh, caribou that were feeding in one place. And it is right on the ocean. And this is where the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline begins. So we arrived, and we had to go through some security checkpoints. And then we helped load up the Ukpik with all the materials, or at least some of the materials that we'd need for the research. Next slide. So we left Prudhoe Bay uh, late in the afternoon because it took us a while to get everything we needed together. And you can see us looking out the stern of the Ukpik. And along the way, it was very foggy, but the fog did clear a couple of times. And we did see on the bottom two pictures some sea ice that went floating by, which was pretty neat because that just let you know that you were actually up on the Arctic Ocean and not just south of East Hampton on a foggy day. And we steamed along quite a ways. It was a very smooth trip. We had a following sea. And in the upper left-hand corner is Dr. Okinen. And I believe he was looking when we were coming close to the island we ended up spending the night behind. Um, and we thought we saw in the distance a polar bear running across the island, away from our uh, boat as it came toward the island. And the next morning, I thought I saw a polar bear, but we think it turned out to be two large seagulls um, together. So uh, you start seeing things because you're so excited when you do actually see things. We did see some seals along the way, a bearded seal and probably a smaller one, a ring seal possibly in the distance. So that was, that was a lot of neat. But for me, seeing the, the differences in sea ice from when I was in Barrow in May, when it was completely covered and I could go walk out on the ocean, to seeing the open water and just some small pieces of sea ice floating around was, was really quite astounding um, and, and very exciting. And you can see me on the upper right-hand side when, when Captain uh, Bill had to leave 
the uh, wheel for for a little bit. But there's great radar systems, and, and it was actually uh, on autopilot. So I didn't actually have to steer the boat directly. I just kept an eye on things and made sure nothing was, was popping up in front of us that shouldn't have been there. Uh, next slide. Um, so on the cruise to Prudhoe Bay, we deployed some moorings. We actually did some work. It wasn't just a, a journey to get the boat from one place to the other. So I'm going to pass the next couple of slides on to Dr. Okinen so he can explain um, the deployment of the moorings and what instruments were actually on those moorings. So introducing Mr. Okinen. Good morning. Um, so on the trip over from Prudhoe, uh, as we approached Barrow, uh, we put in an, an instrument package uh, called a mooring, and you can see it, uh, Lisa and I, assembling it on the fantail of the Ukpik. And I'll go through and point out what uh, the different instruments are. The tall white thing in the middle between uh, Lisa and me is a hydrophone, and it records uh, sounds that marine mammals make, that seals make, that the different whales make. And then uh, directly beneath that, the thing with the blue top is an ADCP, an acoustic Doppler current profiler. It measures and records ocean current speed and direction. And then uh, to the right of that, uh, a conductivity temperature sensor. We call it a microcat. It measures and records ocean salinity and temperature. And then the other instrument uh, to the left the yellow thing with the yellow ball, that's an acoustic release and buoy. This is, uh, this little package helps us recover the mooring uh, when later on in the season, actually it'll be next week, we'll pick this particular mooring up. Um, this is a shallow water mooring. We deployed it in about 19 meters of water or roughly 60 feet deep. Uh, but we have to pick it up before the ice comes in. The ice uh, might uh, reach the bottom if we left it out there over the winter and crush it and we'd lose the instruments. So we have to pick this particular mooring up uh, when we head back to Prudhoe next week. So the, the way this works is we send, we lower a hydrophone over the side of the boat and we send a coded uh, sound down to the orange cylinder there and it releases a little trigger and that ball pops up to the surface. That ball has a line uh, that's attached to the mooring frame, and then uh, with a winch, we can just pick that up and haul it right back on deck. Next slide, please. Uh, about a week later, we deployed a deep water mooring, and uh, this is on the Chukchi side of Barrow, a little west of Barrow, and uh, this is in about 70 meters of water, or roughly 230 feet deep, and this mooring will stay out all year round. Uh, it's much deeper, and so it's unlikely that ice will, uh, ice, ice keels will reach down and damage the mooring. So we can leave it out all year round. And uh, like the other mooring, uh, we put these in to, to measure the weather of the ocean. Uh, on land, it's fairly easy. You can put out an anemometer and a temperature uh, a thermometer, and uh, those can be uh, communicate directly with some station. Well, these, they record uh, temperature, salinity, and currents. Uh, in little memory cards, and uh, we have to come back and get the instruments the next year or a few weeks later, as the case may be. So uh, measuring the weather in the ocean is a little bit different than measuring the weather on land. So anyway, uh, in the upper left-hand picture, uh, we have a very large buoy, the orange ball thing. Uh, you can see the ADCP again. We're mounting it in a little frame that attaches to the large buoy. On the right-hand side, we, there's a picture of a pile of chain. That's our anchor for this particular uh, mooring. And we bundle it all together and, uh, with another piece of chain. Uh, the picture on the bottom shows the conductivity temperature sensor, the microcat, and the acoustic release. Uh, again, when we want to recover this mooring next year, uh, we send a little um, acoustic code down to the acoustic release, it lets go of the chain and then the acoustic release and the buoy float to the surface and we can recover the instruments. So uh, those are my two slides and we'll address questions at some point down the line. Great. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Okunin. And just um, on that slide for a minute, I think what was really neat is the, the release of the buoys, especially after they've been underwater for a year. So we took the Ookpik out. Uh, we actually deployed one mooring, but then we went to look for the next mooring. So we, we got out in the general vicinity, but all you see is open ocean. And Dr. Okunin, if, if you love computers and you're interested in going into anything electronic computer related, forget the video games and become a physical oceanographer because you'll get to play quite a bit with electronics. Most of these instruments hook into computers and that's how they gather the data. But this is pretty cool. You're on the open ocean and Dr. Okunin punches in a code and you hear this little chirping noise and that's the transmitter talking to the receiver in the mooring and then you wait and you're looking all around the ocean and you're waiting hoping that the mooring is going to actually show up and then all of a sudden this big mooring comes popping up out of the ocean because the release worked. So then we collected the mooring and it was a really rolly day when we pulled that mooring up and uh, he gathered the equipment off the mooring and downloaded it and hopefully or is, is going to download it and hopefully has some great information with data from the whole the entire year uh, that it was under the water. So that's that's great. Um, I do see a question. Want to know what is the most important instrument on the boat? Um, probably the engine of the boat. But as far as oceanographic instruments, I, I would think that every one is so specific to the data it collects that the, all the instruments probably work together. Um, Coffee pot. Oh, coffee pot. Coffee pot. Very, very important when you're a physical oceanographer. <laughs> so now we'll go to the next slide. So Prudhoe Bay, we deployed on the way. We deployed the mooring, and then we arrived uh, to to Barrow, um, and the Narl. Uh, it's a, an old Navy base, and you see the blue building. That's actually our lab is inside of that building. And that's often where we eat at the cafeteria. And our hotel, which you see on the upper right-hand side, with it says dormitory style with the phone number, that's actually where we're living. And my room is down on the right-hand side. I guess I should have taken the dirty socks off of the bed before I put the slide up there. Um, it's actually really, really warm and cozy. And you don't really see snow in this picture. It was actually snowing like crazy about 15 minutes ago. But if you remember the... Barrow is actually a desert, polar desert environment. So we typically don't get a lot of precipitation, although I think we hit a record, daily record, for rainfall the other day. So it's been very, very wet, um, an unusual week up here in Barrow. But give it a minute and the weather changes because you go from snow to sun back to sleet. Um, it, it's ever changing. Um, but this is this is where we're staying, and you can see the top left-hand picture is just a view of Narl looking down through the Quonset Hut living area, which is where I stayed in May. So I'm pretty close to that area where we're staying in the hotel now. Next slide, please. So the first day, once we all got together uh, and caught up with Dr. Ashton and Dr. Campbell was putting the equipment together. And I think something you don't really think about is, I don't know, maybe I thought everybody, they always had helpers doing all of this for them, but the, it's a very hands-on experience and the scientists jump right in. Uh, they know the equipment and they know how to put it together. They know how to troubleshoot it. They know how to hook it up to the electronics and, and make sure that it's all working properly. So the, the first day was really setting up the equipment. And you see the Tucker trawl on the top with uh, Dr. Campbell and there was a little troubleshoot there to get the three nets all set so they would open correctly when they wanted them to. And down in the lower right-hand corner, it's actually sort of a cool, I don't know if you'd call it a robot almost like, but it's the acrobat, which they connect and, and they can change. It looks like an airplane and it carries the instruments underneath the ocean and he can control the wing uh, movement so to sort of get it to go to depths wherever he'd like to pick up data. So a lot of very interesting uh, equipment that they use for this research. Next slide. Oop. I think we went two slides ahead, guys. Yeah. Oh, no, there you're right. There we go. 
So then the upper left hand side is our lab and, and the upper right hand side also. My desk is by the far left window. Um, so I actually have a, a nice view of, <laughs> of, well it's not, it's the bay or a lake on one side but then the dumpster on the other side. <laughs> so it's sort of a combo view. And so, so the deal is after we had the equipment all together, a typical day when the weather's good is there's planning in the morning. Usually I get up here and all the scientists are already here and they've got the coffee started, which is awesome. And if the, uh, then we head out to the boat, which is just about a 10 minute drive up the road and put the dinghy on the boat and we head out to sea. Next slide. All right, so then we have pretty much a routine. So we did, I think most of this is from Transex 6, where when we head out, we stop at certain stations. And at each station, you use different equipment. Um, and so I sort of did it in the order of the, how the equipment is deployed. We have the ADCP, and you'll notice after some of these things, I put ADCP in the water with an exclamation point, Niskin bottle back on deck with an exclamation point. And the reason I did that is you're actually, people are shouting these things out as they happen, really for two reasons. One is so that Dr. Ashton and the captain can record the data and the time that these things happened in their logs. So uh, the captain has a ship's log and Dr. Ashton has a science log going. And then the other reason is we're running a boat and a lot of this equipment is very heavy and we're rolling around a lot. So it's important for everyone to know what's going on and, and what's happened and what's about to happen. So the, uh, the ADCP is usually that's towed alongside the boat. And then when we come to a station, often the first thing that happens is Dr. Campbell has been taking um, ocean samples with the, the Niskin bottle, which correctly is spelled N-I-S-K-I-N. <laughs> so a little typo there, sorry about that. But he takes samples at one, what are surface samples, at one and ten meters. And Dr. Okunen will put the Niskin bottle on the CTD, which goes down to a 40 meter depth. So they're, they're picking up salinity and nutrient. Nu uh, nutrient data and chlorophyll data using those Niskin bottles. Next slide. Okay, we lost talk for a second there, but we're back. Um, so the, when anyone's working on the boat, everyone else is also working. They're just either getting things ready or putting things away. So as the CTD is coming up, we'll have uh, usually Dr. Campbell and I, well, he's finishing the Niskin bottle, but I'll be getting the ring net out, which is a single net, plankton net, that we put off of the stern of the research vessel. And at the end, it has a little trap, which you can see I'm holding on the right-hand side, where the plankton and any organisms end up. And that's actually called the cod end of the, the net. And so we get that and put that in the water. And you can see the lower left-hand side is something called the egg, which is, looks like an egg. And it's a weight that goes on the bottom of the net to help get it to the appropriate depth um, for the collection. And then we bring it back up after we've gotten it to the right depth and we open it up and see what we have. Although there was um, I, one, one time when I think you've probably seen the jellyfish picture where there was a little bit of yelling from everyone because it was a really big jellyfish and we're not really studying jellyfish so we were one hand hoping it was going to avoid the net but on the other hand I was, didn't mind that it went in because I really wanted to get a closer look. And sure enough it ended up going in the net. But usually what we're looking for are the smaller organisms, um, especially the krill and the copepods. Next slide. Hey Lisa, this is Sarah. I think you can hear me now. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, how long it takes to review all the data you collect and how you share it? We're getting 30 or 40 questions here and that particular one is from your school. So how do you review all the data and how do you share it? I'll give you your mic back.
time to, uh, it depends on what kind of data you're talking about. So the, the temp, the data you collect with the CTD, um, will, will post it on the Arctic Observing Network website in, um, I don't know, a month or two. Steve looks at it right away. We have Showing you're on. Can can you guys hear us? Yep. Okay. Okay. So we look at the temperature data right away, but um, stuff like the the plankton data and the chlorophyll data, we have to take those samples home and and get them analyzed, and that can be a number of months before we find out what was in the water. So so I guess the answer is it's very different than often what we do in school. Um, for our labs. Usually we have an experiment, if you've, you've done them with Mr. McCormick or Mr. Knight or Mr. Walker over the years, you do an experiment and 40 minutes later you have your data and you're reviewing it with your classmates and having a discussion to determine what did you learn and what did you figure out. Um, when you're out actually doing the research, it can, can take days, weeks, months, or sometimes years to actually collect the data, review it, and be able to start figuring out, you know, what's going on. And in this case, they've been coming up here for eight years, and every year they collect data and they review it, but to put the whole, the idea is to put a whole picture together, so they're, they're, it's going to take them a while to go through it. But that's, that's a great question. One more I'll throw in here, Lisa, a good one about, is there no sea ice because of global warming? And you can press the talk button. Press the talk button. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, good. I feel like I'm doing a cell phone commercial. <laughs> can you hear me now? All right. Um, so the answer, if you if you heard Dr. Ashen, was yes. They they believe the the lack of sea ice is directly related to global warming. And at this point, you see the tucker trawl going in the water that has three plankton nests on it. And I'm trying to think if um, I meant to mention uh, a few minutes ago, I know there's some math teachers out there. There's Jennifer Chichester, who I sent quite a lot of data to do some graphing labs with her students. So those labs um, and data are directly related to some of the instruments that we showed you previously. So the Tucker Trawl is the last set of plankton nets that goes in the water. And that's a really heavy, looks like a sled that goes down. You can see there are three cot ends there to collect the organisms at different points. You take a messenger, which is that weight on the bottom, and you put it on the wire. And when the tucker trawl is down at the right depth, you actually throw that weight down. It goes down the wire until it triggers the next net to open. So that's how they put down it. the tucker trawl has three nets, but the different nets open at different times. Next slide. And I think we skipped over the other slide that actually showed the krill and things that we collect. But these are different organisms that you can collect in those, in those toes. Um, and you're looking typically for, again, the krill and the copepods. But sometimes you get other organisms, like the brittle stars and the jellyfish or the basket starfish. And so those we note and check them out and then put them back in the ocean. Next slide. Oh, there we are. Okay. So here's what more what we're actually looking for. And so we, we get the samples up, and this has been one of my jobs is to help concentrate them, which means putting it through a strainer, getting rid of some of the water and the, the tiny um, maybe plankton, um, phytoplankton, and then putting them into containers, which you can see that they're all labeled for later laboratory analysis. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Campbell, who's going to go and discuss a little bit of his specific research with genetics and populations and the krill. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning. Well, like, at least it's morning here. It might be afternoon where you are. 
uh, Lisa asked me to talk a little bit about the studies we're undertaking here to try to understand something about the zooplankton that are important whale food. Um, as you can see here in this picture, it's a picture that Karen had showed earlier of a euthausider krill. Um, this is the most important food item for bowhead whales in the fall at Barrow. And we know this because we um, can look at the stomach contents from whales that are harvested here in the fall. Um, they're fairly large result plankton, up to about 25 millimeters in length, which is about an inch. But the important thing about these zooplankton is that they form dense schools or aggregations. A single krill or euphalsia would not be much of a meal for, for a bowhead whale, but these large schools um, can, make a nice, can make a very nice meal for a bowhead. Um, next slide, please. Another important food source for bowheads are copepods, uh, especially in the genus Calamus. These are very large copepods, although they're much smaller than krill, only up to about 8 millimeters in length. Um, the important thing about these copepods are that they have much higher fat content than krill. You can see, if you look at these images of, of uh, Calamus glacialis, you can see those large sacs inside the animal. Those are filled with oil, and they're um, very important uh, part of the diet for krill, uh, for, for uh, bowhead whales. So they're, so they're different, th they're smaller than krill, but they're much richer in fats. So that's important, um, can be an important uh, food source for krill as well. And, and like the krill, these also form dense aggregations. So a single copepod would not be a, a, a good meal for uh, a bowhead whale, but large aggregations um, can make for a very nice meal. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things we're interested in is where did the krill and copepods that we see in Barrow come from? Um, we want to know are these from local populations that have been grown up in the Arctic? Or are they from far away, transported in the currents from the Pacific Ocean? You can see in this diagram the, um, the blue uh, arrows show the currents um, or transport of water from the Pacific into the Arctic. These currents uh, carry heat, salt, nutrients, and plankton, such as zooplankton, from the Pacific into the Arctic. So one of our questions while we're here is, how do we know where these animals are come from? Are they local, or are they invested here from the Pacific? Uh, next slide, please. This is a picture of, uh, of four different copepod species that we collected from the same net toe just a few days ago here off of Barrow. Um, the two copepods on the left are neocalamus, and we know that they come from the Pacific Ocean. They're not found in the Arctic. So we know that these two copepods came up in those currents and were found here in Barrow. The third copepod from the left, Calamus hyperboreus, is an Arctic species. It's found in the deep basins, just adjacent to the uh, Barrow shelf here. This species is not found in the Pacific Ocean, so we know that this is a local species and not transported in the currents. The fourth species, Calamus glacialis, there on the, on the far right, is found in both the Pacific and Arctic Oceans. So just by looking at this species, uh, this, this, this uh, copepod, we cannot say for certain where it came from. It could have been grown up locally, or it could have been transported here in the current, um, from the Pacific Ocean in those currents. Uh, Next slide, please. So how can we tell where the zooplankton came from if we don't know for certain by the species where, 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 it, um, where it was uh, grown up? Um, for krill, as well as, as the copepod Calamus glacialis, um, we see both, uh, we see the same species in the Pacific and in the Arctic Ocean. If you look at the, the map on the left, um, this shows uh, pie diagrams of, uh, of, of different, oh, oh, I should point out that this is, these are what we do, the way we tell whether, um, where the, these zooplankton come from is we use genetics to do this. And what we do is we collect the animals up here in the Arctic, and we bring them back to our lab in Rhode Island, and we extract and amplify the DNA from these organisms. And then we sequence that DNA, and that tells us about the populations of these animals. So animals with a, a given genetic sequence are from a certain population. If you look at the diagram on the left, which shows the um, populations of krill that we see in the Bering Sea, 
on the, the lower pie diagram and those that we collected off of Barrow. Um, yeah, the, thanks. The, the, <laughs> the uh, little indicator helps, helps with uh, showing those locations. You can see that these pie diagrams that show the proportions of different different sequences of krill at the different locations are almost identical. This indicates to us that the krill that we're catching or collecting off a of barrel are the same populations that we're seeing in the Bering Sea. So we believe that the krill we're collecting in barrel are from the Pacific Ocean or to be more exact from the Bering Sea. For copepods of count, uh, that I've just mentioned, Calanus glacialis, it's much more complex. If you look on the right side, Diagram. This shows the um, the population genetics for um, the copepod Calanus glacialis and the related species Calanus marshalli. The green pie diagrams down in the Gulf of Alaska to the south of the Aleutian Island chain are um, sequences of Calanus marshalli, which is a very closely related species to glacialis, and we cannot tell them apart um, by just looking at them. We need to use genetics. The red um, sequences shown mostly in the Bering Sea and in the Arctic are from Pacific populations of Calanus glacialis. And the blue are from Arctic populations of glacialis. As you can see off of Barrow at the top of Alaska, it's a mixing zone where we see both populations of glacialis from the Pacific as well as from the Arctic. And if you look very closely, you can actually see a little sliver of green, which indicates that some of the Calanus marshalli are actually making it up to Barrow. So one of the questions that we want to try to understand is how will climate change affect these uh, zooplankton populations? Will krill eventually colonize the Arctic so that we may eventually have separate Arctic and Pacific populations? Will the smaller copepod from the Pacific populations of glacialis um, replace the Arctic populations, or, or even will Helms marshalli, the warm water species, become more important in the Arctic? And how might these changes that might be brought about by climate change, how might they affect the Arctic green ecosystem? So these are just a few of the questions that we're trying to address here while we're doing our work in Barrow. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. That was awesome. Um, so we get down to the end of our first just a note going back to slides on the different copepods and the krill that we're looking at is um, is something unexpected. They're really beautiful to look at, especially when you're getting them and they're alive. When Dr. Campbell does a lot of his work, he actually anesthetizes. Were these anesthetized or recently? Yes, yeah. So they're anesthetized um, so that he can examine them closer under the microscope. And, and they're really pretty neat. You're seeing them when they're anesthetized or they die. They sort of tuck into that position that you're seeing now. Um, hopefully, um, I'll be bringing back some pictures. Well, I'll definitely bring back some pictures for us to look at of what they look like when they're fully awake and, and swimming around because they, they have a different body position, um, which, is, which is pretty neat to see. So that was a surprise at just how interesting and the, the fine detail that these organisms have. So the final, final slides end up with, you know, what's all an important question, especially when you've been out on the ocean working hard and it's cold and, and what have we been eating? Well, we've been eating a mix of things from healthy choices to not so healthy choices. Um, and we've had some amazing meals. You can see one meal on top of, on the top, which was a mix of a beef stew, uh, jambalaya, and uh, I think tortilla. a tortilla soup. Um, all really great choices. We decided that it was Labor Day. We needed to have a barbecue. So we actually, there's actually a community college um, that's part of on the Gnarl campus where we're staying. And they had used a barbecue and had a barbecue earlier that day. And they were kind enough to let us also borrow it and cook up some steaks and asparagus and zucchini and potatoes and things. So we had a, had a great meal. We eat meals, a lot of them, at the cafeteria. And sometimes we go out, which is the polar bear scene down below on the left-hand side. And there are a lot, actually quite a, a surprising number of restaurants in Barrow. But no matter what the name or ethnicity of the restaurant, I find that they all offer the same variety of foods from Oriental to American hamburgers to great pizza. And Dr. Campbell uh, combined the two the other night when he had Mongolian chicken pizza or what? <laughs> so 
Kung Pao chicken. Oh, Kung Pao chicken pizza. <laughs> um, so I'll let you decide which, if that's a healthy choice or a not so healthy choice. And then Dr. Okinen, it was his birthday, and he was sent up a package of bacon products, including bacon jelly beans, which are actually pretty gross, um, <laughs> bacon toothpaste, and a few other things. And then the mint Oreos was an interesting story because several people loved them on the boat, but that was the one thing that gave me a moment of feeling seasick, was just looking at the packaging. So I had to tuck them under a towel for the rest of that trip. <laughs> so we've been eating mostly healthy choices, but we do have some snack foods, and that's the captain, uh, one of the captains, Captain Mike on the upper right-hand side down in the bilge, getting us a new supply of chips from the, the hull of the boat. And the last slide. <laughs> the last slide is, again, going back to, wow, it's, first, it's snowing like crazy out again. Um, but again, people were wondering and hoping I would be safe and taken care of, and, and I could not have, I feel like I hit the perfect trifecta of researchers. Um, it's, this has been an amazing experience. They're all incredibly uh, good at what they do, and they're also amazingly um, great at explaining what they're doing and allowing me to jump right in and participate in whatever we're working on, which has been really great. And, and you know, all day long they haven't appeared anyway to get tired of my asking them questions when I'm putting together lesson plans or videos so that I can bring all of this information back to the students. So it's, it's really been a great experience. You'll notice most of these pictures, I think all of them, someone's got a smile on their face. There's a lot of laughter behind the seriousness of the research that they're doing, um, which really helps uh, when you're working in, a, in the Arctic environment. And, and that's the end of our sli slideshow. I see a few questions about the bacon products. <laughs> um, and, um, and I really appreciate everyone joining us up here in Barrow. It's, uh, it's nice to have you come along. And I feel All right, we can't. Are you talking, Sarah? Okay, so here's what's going to happen here. Um, we can give you some time. If you can hear me, Janet. All right, great. Uh, so if you do have a question you want to ask live, I think we have time for maybe two questions real quick here. So you can raise your hand uh, just above where the list of participants are. There is a hand button. So press that and we will call on you and have your question ready for Lisa and the team. Yes, we had lots of questions from the audience during the presentation. We wrote all of them down and we'll get them to Lisa or you can ask them via the Ask the Team forum. So does anybody want to ask a question live? Go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to. All right, I see that Diane's ready. So um, Diane, go ahead and press talk and then press it again when you are done asking your question. Hi, this is Ms. Depp, 8th grade science class here at Spring School, and her students would like to know how the earthquake in Japan had any effect on the bowhead whale migration. Go ahead, Lisa, or the team, as you discuss. Hi. Um, I think the consensus is that it probably did not, <coughs> excuse me, have an effect on the bowhead migration based on their path of the migration and the distance away that the earthquake occurred. But great question. Great. Yeah. Anyone else would like to ask a question live? I'll let you think for a minute and get students ready if you do have one more question. While we're looking to see if we have any other questions, teachers, if you're interested in Polar Trek, there's lots of different ways that you can connect by following expeditions such as Lisa's, join other Polar Connected, 
um, take online courses and perhaps in the future become a Polytrek teacher. All right, I don't see any live questions happening. We could jump back to a few of these others that, or one other that might have been, might have been um, um, asked earlier. The uh, question was, why is why the spike in the, the two? Go, go ahead, Sarah. Why the spike in the 2006 sea ice levels? We think it's related to uh, kind of the average winds in August. Uh, at that time, I think the winds were more from the north, north to south, north to south. so it uh, pushed ice from the north down southward. Uh, in more recent years, the years in which we do not have ice here in Barrow, uh, winds are from the south and pushing ice northward. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Sarah, I have a Can you hear us, Sarah? Go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead, Lisa. I see the one, the question about how long do bowhead whales live. So I'll go ahead and, and address that. Is, is scientists believe they live over over a hundred years? Um, they, I think they had one that appears to have been 130 years old. But I think what's most interesting is how they are determining the age of these bowheads. And um, one of the ways is they actually look at the eyeballs, uh, the eyes <laughs> of a deceased whale. And um, there's an acid that forms when the whale is born in that part, in the eye, and it actually um, changes as a whale ages. And they're able to study the amount of the original sort of proteins and, uh, and acids that are in the proteins and compare it to um, the amount they're actually finding and determine how old the whale is. So they're using the whale eyes to determine the age. They're also using, if they find, um, sometimes a whale may have been hunted and not actually killed. And so they find bits and pieces of some of the spearheads in whales that they do catch later. And they can date the age of those um, spear tips. And a final way they can look at the baleen and actually, they, because the whales, the bowhead whales' uh, diet is carbon-based, they can actually look at the, uh, the carbon that's in the baleen. Although, as a whale gets older, the baleen can start to wear down. So that's not a, not a perfect plan. But they can look at all of these different things to determine how old uh, the bowhead whales are, which has helped them to realize that they live a long time. Again, some of them upwards and over 100 years old. So, terrific question. And I see a, a question about um, how do the people in Barrow think about the research? And I think there's been a real effort to bring the newer science researchers together with the knowledge and traditional knowledge of the local population and, and getting people to a, a big focus on getting everyone to work together and realize that so much of the traditional knowledge is incredibly important and they have a wealth of data and information um, that they've co collected in a qualitative manner that they can combine with some of the quantitative research that's, that's going on recently. Another good question. Uh, yep, we're still on. <laughs> We're at the end. Um, so this is Janet. So the question was, um, these are for you. They came from your students early on, and you might just touch on them. There was somebody wanting to know, how is it that you travel in Alaska? And then just a really quick one, what time is it? So we can answer that. But mostly, how do you get around in Alaska? Well, oh, first, that's another great question. I think so there are no roads lead to Barrow. There's a road that led to Prudhoe Bay, but I actually flew in. Um, but Barrow is very isolated. So to get to Barrow, you have to either come by plane or by boat. And to get around Barrow itself is we drive. Just 
like we get around Springs or East Hampton is we have a truck and we can go into town. Uh, you can walk around, but you, have, you do have to be aware and watch out for polar bears. Um, and again, we haven't seen any, but you're also you're always you're not in fear of them, but you're aware that they are in the area, and you just need to to keep your eyes out. Um, but we get around basically the same way that you get around Springs. But just sort of imagine if you couldn't get out of Springs except by using a helicopter or a plane or a boat, because we are the town itself is is isolated. And uh, one more question for you, and we'll wrap this up. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you've been able to find out about the population of penguins in Alaska. Uh, okay, we, we have, and there are absolutely no penguins in Alaska. Um, if if um, just think polar bears in the Arctic, which is around the North Pole and the northern regions of the world, and think penguins closer to the, in the, the South Pole area, more Antarctic, um, tip of South America, maybe New Zealand and a few other places. But polar bears, polar bears are up north, penguins are down south, and they don't mix. You won't see them in the same photograph unless someone's photoshopped them together. But good question because that's a common, a common thought because everyone pictures ice and they just think it's ice in either pole. Um, so it's actually a really, really good question and it's important to clarify and understand which organisms live where. All right. Uh, and um, we had, I just typed in, there's been a lot of questions about, um, you know, how, when do bowheads uh, have babies and just a lot of life history questions. And Sarah and I think that maybe just one journal or um, might be dedicated to that or where you, you know, direct people to some resources about that because there's a lot of work out there and a lot of really good questions. But um, we realize that's not the focus of these scientists. Um, they're looking at how the where the whales live and the ocean conditions and why how it impacts the bowhead. So um, there's lots of great science out there about bowhead. So we'll just have you um, direct those people and ask all those questions um, through the journals. And then also, um, I think it's time for us to sign off. A bunch of classrooms have been um, signing off and said thank you on the way and. You guys, I know, have a, a day ahead of you that you need to start working on. So we want to say thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And, and it's such an early hour in Alaska, but um, um, it was really fun to hear our, everything about what you're doing. And, and uh, it's been a great expedition. Yep, goodbye everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. And those were terrific questions. And um, I will see everyone back in East Hampton soon. All right. Thank you very much, Lisa and team. Great to see your faces. And uh, we look forward to uh, following your adventure to Point Hope and seeing how that goes as well. So if you uh, this. Um, event will be archived and we'll post it online. And uh, if you're sticking around, you can um, say goodbye to uh, Lisa and the team here. We'll open up the mic as